Hello Booktube. This sideline video, that's what I'm going to call these now. I want you to be able to distinguish them from, from coffee breaks. Coffee break videos, they are less than 10 minutes and they generally deal with a, a bookish topic that's light, you know, easy on the brain. <laughs> sideline videos, they're going to be longer and they do a bit more of a deep dive into a subject. Now, if you watched my review of Gore Vidal's Myra Breckenridge, you will recall that we pretty much took that review at the pace of a forced march. I charged through the questions, literally, because I had more notes than I'd ever had for a review before. And all I could think of was like, my God, this video is going to be way too long and I really don't like long videos. To me, the optimum length for a YouTube video is less than 20 minutes. So, okay, the Vidal review you watched, it came to just under 17 minutes. So, whew, relief, okay? But the truth is the only way that I got under that 20 minute threshold was by cutting. Loads of my notes, they got saved to another location because I, I made a judgment call on them. I, I looked at them and thought, nah, this, this topic is a diversion. It's, it's not really about what the book is. And then in hindsight, I thought, no, this isn't a diversion. The single reason that Gore Vidal wrote the novel was to discover the person of Myra Breckenridge. I'm going to quote now. Remember the, the biography by Jay Perini. I'm going to quote from page 195. This is Vidal being quoted from an interview he gave in 1993. He says, I recall sitting at my desk on a warm spring day in Rome, staring into space, when a voice entered my head. I am Myra Breckenridge whom no man will ever possess. I never quite had that experience. An otherworldly voice, one that took me over. I felt like a medium. The book poured out in a few weeks. The short chapters just unfurled. I felt I must find out what happened and watch the developing plot with interest. End quote. And you see, novels that write themselves like that, they're interesting to me. They seem to be coming from somewhere outside the writer. And it's what the classical world, it must be the reason they invented muses, to try to explain that kind of literary experience. Okay, before I get started, big spoiler alert. I am going to reveal a lot of key plot points as I talk. So if you've taken the decision you want to read Myra and you want all the enjoyment of surprise, then, you know, close this video now. OK, you know, come back maybe when you've when you've read the book. Yeah. If you're like me and you think you'll probably forget everything that I say after a couple of days, that's my memory, folks. Um, so you'll still have all the enjoyment of surprise, right? Mm? Uh, then, you know, it'll be great to have your company right now. Right. Welcome back. New picture. First spoiler. Myra Breckenridge is a trans woman. She was assigned male at birth and her mother named her Myron. Myron underwent gender reassignment surgery and hormone treatment to change her body. Yet, as I was reading the novel, this funny question just kept nagging me. Um, you know, was Myra providing transgender representation? I mean, that might sound like the weirdest question. I mean, she, what else? What else could she be if she is a trans woman? Then surely she's providing trans representation. Well, you see, by the end of the novel, the answer that I came to was that she was not representative, uh, but in another way she was. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know. I got to explain that. I know, I know, you, you know, like, what do I mean, first of all, when I say that Myra was not representative? Like, like, how? In what way? Well, what I mean is that I, throughout the text, I couldn't find any indication that Myra had experienced gender dysphoria before she transitioned. And there was nothing in the text to kind of convince me that Myra felt more like her authentic self after she transitioned. The reasons that she gave for the transition as well, see, you know, you remember the quote from the review, to destroy traditional masculinity. I thought, well, okay, Myra, I get that you're angry I, against traditional masculinity. I get that. Uh, but, you know, revenge, that seems like a bit of a weird uh, reason to transition. Hmm. So, and then later in the novel, 
you, you have Myra, she gets her revenge on one man, Rusty Godowski. He seems to represent for her traditional masculinity. And once she has dealt with him, okay, I'm not going to describe that. That is the infamous chapter 29. I shall leave that for you to read. See, after she does that, she seems completely satisfied. And she doesn't pick on another victim. Instead, she starts a relationship with Rusty's former girlfriend, Marianne. And when she's talking to her therapist, this is page 167 of the novel, Myra tells him that she needs to possess Marianne. And she says, quote, in order that the cycle be completed. Cycle? Yeah, I mean, I mean, her therapist doesn't know what she's talking about either. He, he asks her to explain. He says to Myra, but who and what will you be? And that's when Myra makes a confession to herself. She says, quote, I have no clear idea as to my ultimate identity. Once every fantasy has been acted out in the living flesh, all I do know is that I will be freed of obsession and, in this at least, be like no one else who has ever lived. Well, that was the one thing that rang true. I thought, if there is a person in this world like Myra Breckenridge, then I, I've i never met them, I've never heard of them. Uh, I will keep looking, but, you know, um, she does seem to be something quite extraordinary. So... It seemed to me that even though Myra had transitioned, she'd still not arrived at the person she truly wanted to be. And at that point, I began to wonder, you know, whether Vidal had created Myra for a different purpose than trans representation. I'm not trans myself. Um, I have listened to trans people tell their stories on podcasts and YouTube, and I did go and listen to a few more. I, I wanted to see if I could find a story that reminded me of Myra Breckenridge, but if that story's out there, I haven't found it yet. In the meantime, I reached the last chapter of the book and the final surprise. Myra is writing in her journal, as usual, but she tells me that she's resumed a male identity as Myron, again, and that Myron and Mary Ann are now husband and wife, and they live in a little house in suburban San Fernando Valley, you know, with a few acres of land and lemon and olive trees. And, you know, and they have a barbecue pit and they invite their neighbors over now and again. And I was like, that's when I got really confused. I thought, never mind Myra not knowing what they were. I now had absolutely no idea. <laughs> the only thing I felt sure of was that authors, they create characters for a reason. Right. And, and that this character, this character was one that made Gore Vidal write about them, write their story. So I felt that Myra and Myron, they were important somehow. So I reviewed the character's whole life. Okay, they began as a gay man who's had many sexual partners. Then they transitioned to a woman who expresses attraction to both men and women, um, but needs to take revenge on this traditional masculinity. So, right, so she, she takes revenge on one cis-hetero man. Then she falls in love with a cis woman, Marianne, uh, even though Marianne is, is kind of reluctant to enter a lesbian relationship. Then finally, Myra reverses some of the transitional surgery and stops taking her hormone treatments. And she takes back her identification as Myron. And she begins a monogamous relationship with Marianne. And they appear to be identical to your your sort of 1960s television suburban American couple except that you know Myron cannot father children but that doesn't seem to bother him or Marianne they're totally fine with that so the more I thought about it the more it seemed that this creation of Myra Breckenridge it wasn't about the representation of any particular sexuality or gender expression the character had expressed every expression. They literally represented everything, everything and anything and the complete freedom to be anything. And of course, that freedom would need to attack traditional concepts of masculinity because it's those concepts that are at the root of what traps everybody in gender and, and sexual stereotypes. And it's what makes people frustrated and angry because they can't express their authentic selves. Okay, so what conclusion did I come to? In my mind, Myra, Myron, she was something more than human. What do I mean by that? I mean, she was a symbol, maybe an energy, a spirit. There's a word I'm looking for. 
archetype. That's the word I'm looking for, archetype. Uh, Myra made me think of the tarot, particularly the Thoth tarot, which was a collaboration between the occultist Aleister Crowley and the painter Lady Frida Harris. Could I just, I just want to show you a couple of cards from that deck on screen. Bear with me. This is card number two and card number 14 of the Major Arcana. The figure on the left is the High Priestess. Now, she is feminine down to her waist. So you can see that she has breasts. Down below that, uh, her legs are heavier in build and the bow and arrow on her lap is a phallic symbol. So she is an androgynous being. Her hands are extended out to touch two pillars which represent opposite energies and she is either receiving energy from them or giving energy to them. So she is uh, an androgynous figure. On the right you have art or alchemy. So that is also a two-headed, you know, opposites together in the same body kind of um, representation. And that person is mixing together the opposing elements of fire and water. Now I could talk forever about tarot symbolism, right? Don't let me do that. I just want to say that, that the interpretation that seems most relevant to Myra Breckenridge is that these figures represent all possibilities of expression. The art or the alchemy card emphasizes how every individual is a specific selection of expressions unique to them. The High Priestess is almost a guardian of the sacredness of all possibilities. And it is the High Priestess symbol that to me began to feel the same as Myra Breckenridge and Myra Breckenridge began to seem to me to be the high priestess of all expression, ensuring that people are never cut off from the authentic expression of themselves. And that, when I look back at the novel, that seemed to align. Let me quote again. This is I'm going to end this video with this quote from Myra on page 180. She says, A new world is being born without a single reliable witness except me. I alone have the intuition as well as the profound grasp of philosophy and psychology to trace for man not only what he is, but what he must become. Once he has ceased to be confined to a single sexual role, to a single person, once he has become free to blend with others, to exchange personalities with both men and women, to play out the most elaborate of dreams in a world where there will be no limits to the human spirit's play. As I have been goddess, so others can be whatever they want in this vast theater we call the world. And so that is why I believe that Myra Breckenridge is a trans representative novel, because the character truly stands for the end of cis hetero as the only acceptable option for sexual and gender expression and defends complete freedom of individual expression instead. I'm very, very glad that Myra inspired Gore Vidal to write in 1968 and announce the beginning of that new world. Thanks everybody for indulging me in this sideline deep dive into Gore Vidal's novel. Thanks to everybody actually who has um, been checking out my content, subscribing, liking, really kind, really encouraging. My next video will be a coffee break, which will continue the DNF did not finish meditation series. Hope to see you all again then. Thanks very much for tuning in and bye-bye.